Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. Happy Saturday. Happy, beautiful, sunny day in spring. Thank you all so much for being here on your Saturday and spending your time with us. My name is Ruth Starr. I oversee accessibility here at Cooper Hewitt. I just love to do this. Can I see a show of hands? Who has been to Cooper Hewitt before? Oh, a good amount. All right, whose first time is it at Cooper Hewitt today? Nice, okay, solid. Well, welcome to the new folks and welcome back to those of you who have been here before. We're so thrilled. Um, I'm gonna let Sean introduce the panelists in a second, but we're so thrilled to have, I'll turn on your microphone, Sean, not to worry, <laughs> and then she'll introduce the panelists, not to worry. But we're so thrilled at Cooper Hewitt to be hosting this conversation. <laughs> Many of you may be familiar, the museum launched an exhibition about a year ago called Access Plus Ability. Uh, the exhibition focused on accessible and inclusive design, predominantly for individuals with disabilities. So we've been really thrilled at the museum to bring on this work and to, to think about ourselves and our own practices across the institution from exhibitions to education. So this panel, I think, is all a part of that. We are just some housekeeping going to do a couple films. So we're gonna show those shortly. This uh, event was organized with our dear friends at Real Abilities New York. So it is, of course, <laughs> Real Abilities Festival. Yara is at the door and she'll have brochures. So if other folks want to find out more events, please see Yara. Um, and I'm sure all of us would love to share some good films to see. So we'll see some films and then from all of our panelists and their work as well. Apologies for my technicalness here, but, <laughs> but just see the screen. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ruth, thank you. You're the star of everything. Um, and this panel would not be possible without all these women here, but also Ruth and especially Yara and our fashion panel team. I see uh, Ronnie in the back there. Um, so I just want to say thank you to that. Um, before we get into the videos, I thought it would be great if these ladies uh, could take a moment to introduce themselves. So Mary, we start with you. Great. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Mary Anderson and I am a principal technical designer uh, with Target and I work on the Cat and Jack adaptive brand. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Keitlinger and I also work at Target. I'm the director for Girl, Cat and Jack and I get to work on adaptive with Mary here. Hi everyone. Oh, Oh, see, teamwork. Hi, everyone. My name is Grace. Um, I'm an assistant professor of fashion at Parsons School of Design, and I'm the executive director at Open Style Lab, a, a nonprofit that makes style accessible. Cool. Hello, everybody. I'm Alexis Kasher. I'm speaking through a sign language interpreter, and he happens to be a male today. <laughs> I'm the founder of Rose by Ander, a new, new jewelry company. We're actually launching this week. Congratulations. We're going to get into the meat of all this, but I just wanted to make sure you knew um, the amazing people up here first before we show their incredible videos. So are we ready for those? The amazing thing about Cat and Jack and Adaptive Apparel is that we're making inclusive, affordable, comfortable clothes that can let kids of all abilities just belong. We discovered we can really help people with disabilities just by doing a few things differently with our clothing. Taking existing styles and adapting them to different types of disabilities. It can be something small like removing tags and having flat seams to building a jacket that's made for someone that's in a wheelchair. Each item that we've developed for this collection has been inspired by a story and a person. I'll never forget the moment that I met Chris and Bentley. It was at our first adaptive photo shoot where we had kids with disabilities come in to actually be the models. When I showed her a shirt for kids who need abdominal access, she immediately got tears in her eyes. And I just hugged her. I just had to hug her and tell her how important this is. And I said, you have no idea the difference that this has made. Bentley was born at 31 weeks with probably 25 different diagnoses. It wasn't until the Cat and Jack line where he got to just be a kid. All of a sudden, his life revolves around being a seven-year-old. We didn't have to fight. We didn't even have to ask. It magically appeared from a team of people who created this out of love and kindness. 
When the line first launched, I don't think that we understood the impact that it made on people's lives. Each story has led us to solve a problem that's gonna make someone's life just a little bit easier. Well, you've worked really hard. I think that's the least they can do for you guys, right? Okay, great. All right, next up, Open Style Lab. I feel like I'm emceeing now. <laughs> My name is Grace, and I have been in this field between fashion and technology for quite some time now. Prior, I used to work in IT, so I had some experience with mobile technology and wearable tech, which got me a lot more interested into doing the work I'm doing today. So I'm an assistant professor at the School of Fashion at Parsons, and I'm also the executive director at Open Style Lab. And I came full circle to really figure out what I wanted to do with my life and to have, I think, more of a meaningful impact with the skills and talents that I was able to acquire. Open Style Lab was initiated at MIT in 2014, and we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to making style and accessible clothing available for people with disabilities, which might mean anywhere from injury to aging. Before my OSL garment, I would shove a golf umbrella down my shirt and that's the way that I kept rain from getting on. Now I have a very sleek and fashionable jacket that completely keeps me dry and it's awesome. I have multiple fractured vertebrate, uh, compressed vertebrate in my back and was a client uh, and was looking for a garment that would allow me to sit against chairs and cushion my back comfortably. I'm a board of directors. I also was a previous client. I suffer from paralysis in both arms, and an amazing team at Open Style Lab created this wonderful coat that I can apply without the use of my arms. Open Style Lab is life-changing in an inclusive environment for someone with a disability. Stories of people is really important to Open Style Lab and to the work that we do. And the way we see it growing for the future is not only through education or raising awareness, but the way I've described Open Style Lab is that we don't make products or services, we make experiences. So how do we bring in the experience of having someone talk about difficult things around disability or aging to a more creative atmosphere? mentioned stories in your video and how and I also by the way if you get a chance Target has a new podcast that uh, Mary you were on right and she talked about how you know at Target the stories really fuel the innovation and so I, I thought maybe we could open it up you could share your story a little bit how, what got you here and um, well I my background in education is I um, went to a university in Wisconsin and I um, received my apparel design degree and um, I started working for Target straight out of college and I had a little bit different experience with my education where I had a baby in college mm -hmm. and um, it really made me you know obviously take things a little bit more seriously than maybe somebody else um, going through college and um, 
then about three years ago, we started doing research on what it would be like to create sensory-friendly clothing for kids with um, sensory processing disorder or autism. And actually, Amy and I were working together at the time. And she came to work one day after having wine with a girlfriend. Um, her girlfriend has two kids with autism. And she's like, hey. Designers drink wine. Yeah, yeah, you know, once in a while. Um, and she just said, she knew that I was um, a very empathetic person. I do a lot of volunteering with the elderly. And um, she knew I was the right person to ask, like, hey, let's just start doing research and see where this leads. Um, and so that kind of is where my um, education and originally working with for Target out of college kind of led to this adaptive clothing. Amy, anything you wanted to add to that story? Anything uh, yeah. that happened when the wine was out that we don't know about? Well, <laughs> um, no, my friend Jackie, she's very outspoken, has two children with autism, and she was just really frustrated with what was in the market. It was not affordable, it was not cute, and she wanted her kids to wear Cat and Jack, so she just looked at me and said, why can't Cat and Jack do sensory-friendly apparel? Um, and so I just got really excited, and I knew Mary was the first person I wanted to talk to about it. And then fast forward three and a half years, we have a full line of sensory-friendly apparel and adaptive, so it's just a dream come true, really. And I don't know, we've had an amazing time doing it. And you know, as you can imagine, it's not just the two of us no. creating all this <laughs> and making it happen. Um, there's a, th a third person who was in the video as well, um, Stacy Munson, who has a daughter who has autism and she is not potty trained, now she's nine. And Stacy was kind of starting to do um, research on what it would be like to create her own apparel line. And the three of us working in, under the same roof um, at headquarters in Minneapolis, we discovered each other through social media that we were kind of all working on this at the same time. So, yeah, it started from there. And then, you know, obviously at Target, we have a lot of different resources and teams. So I think there's hundreds of people ha who have touched it at this point. But Great. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy to finally meet you. I actually met Stacy first, so I'm, it, it feels very full circle and complete to meet the rest of the power team. So thank you guys so much for sharing. And Grace, um, I know your journey has been, you know, quite epic. So if you can share with us a little bit of your story, the backstory, how you got to Open Style Lab. Yeah, and thanks, Sean. She wrote my epic journey on, on. Um, the news. A little thing called <laughs> Forbes, little maybe. thing called Forbes, but <laughs> um, I was like, wow, that covered my entire life story. And <laughs> so I actually began as a graphic designer, but I think I took a very non-traditional path and to really look at design um, without fear, because uh, I'm sure some parents here might be like, what is my kid going to do as a designer? Like, are they going to starve? What, are they going to paint in Central Park? You know, we've had the same <laughs> questions all along, even in higher education, but I, I think I was fortunate enough to find, through also a personal experience, um, having paralysis, like there, there are really wonderful ways to explore creativity. And so that has led me uh, to find some friends who were at MIT at the time, and they were starting a public service project called Open Style Lab, which was actually a lab there. Mm. And they're like, yeah, we're just teaming designers, therapists, and engineers with people with disabilities here in Boston. And we're going to make clothes. And I asked them, do you guys know how to make clothes? <laughs> and they did it. So I joined <laughs> uh, fresh out of Samsung Electronics. And since then, uh, I've been teaching full time. And I never thought in the last decade I would ever teach. And what that means, I feel like I'm learning every day instead of teaching. So. That's how I came to this um, park. Not to interrupt, but I think you kind of glossed over one very important thing, and the paralysis that you experienced was the result of a car accident, right? Um, and can you just talk quickly about what that, uh, did it change your point of view, and if so, how? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I'll bring back a statistic for us, right? You know, one out of four, one out of five people identify having a disability, but four out of five uh, people also love or know someone with a disability, and that could pertain to somebody who has injury or someone who's aging. So for me, I've experienced at an earlier age in my college senior year, uh, at my last year when I should be graduating, mm -hmm. and not being able to move my right arm. So for me, I was like, I'm done. I can't move this mouse. I, I can't be a designer. So that kind of changed the way I thought about just interaction and what design could do. 
And yeah, long story short, that's why I'm here in this lovely panel today. <laughs> well, we're so happy to have you again. Uh, Grace was also part of our fashion panel last year, and so much has happened that we had to have her back to update us on all the things they're doing in the last year and more. Um, so Alexis, can you do, uh, I'm just so honored. I feel, we met a month ago. I feel like I know you 10 years already. Um, I feel like I know your heart. So anyway, um, for those that don't know you yet, um, can you share a little bit of your story and how you got to Rose Byander? Okay. So I am deaf, as you can all probably tell. I also come from a multi-generational deaf family. My parents and grandparents are all deaf. I have one sister, and she's the only hearing member of our entire family. So I grew up in that environment. My parents were pioneers in developing assistive technology for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Notification systems primarily, flashing lights to indicate a doorbell or a telephone ring, and other kinds of notifications that deaf people need to receive. But they also made those notification systems mobile so that people could travel around the world, stay in hotels and motels, et cetera, and still have access in these temporary lodgings, just to make sure they could still receive the same notifications. But I didn't know how special my parents were. Of course, as a kid growing up with parents, <laughs> you don't think they're that special. <laughs> I went to law school after college. Well, let me back up, actually. I had to fight for my own access to education at the age of 14 years old. And that influenced my decision to go to law school and become an attorney. I started practicing special ed law, representing children with disabilities, ensuring that they had access to their needs. And by the time that I graduated, at the same time, actually, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. And now you know how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I practice both special ed law as well as civil rights. And I did that for, a, let's just say, a long time. And through that process, I saw different avenues to make the world a better place for people with disabilities, much like my parents did. So I took some time off. I relocated to New York from Los Angeles and I took time to raise my three children. And during that time, my sister and I decided to make a family treasure, just an heirloom to represent our sisterhood in a family of multi-generational deaf people, and also something that would represent our connection to American Sign Language and the deaf community. So we just created this for ourselves only. And through that process, I met so many people who would comment on the piece that we, I was wearing. And I realized that it was such an organic and natural conversation that I was getting results from. That was the best form of activism that I had experienced because it was natural, it was friendly, and it was out of people's curiosity, as opposed to litigation, which is the <laughs> form of activism that I was used to. So from there, I decided to bring this to life and share it with the public. And I guess I became a designer when I did that. So anyway, Amazing. that's how I got here. I love the idea of fashion as activism. Um, I, let's let that sit in for a minute. Um, I think that's really powerful because it's something that's expected us of, of us every day. That is, if we do actually wear clothes outside um, <laughs> our homes. Um, yeah, unless you're in a nudist colony, most people have fashion right in their lives. And I can say, because I didn't really, I realized I didn't really introduce myself either, that I had two very fashionable parents. Um, my mom takes five minutes to get ready and looks like she's ready for the red carpet. And my dad is the first metrosexual that has ever lived um, and so I thought that was their department I'm like okay my parents are the fashionable ones I'm the big hippie in the family and I thought okay that's their department I can you know my art is wor words right so um, so it is really amazing and I just want to thank Grace too that when I went to her first presentation where we met 
was this accessibility meetup um, that's not even fashion related, it's more tech related, but they like doing presentations that are kind of outside the usual box. And I had done like a Google Hangout with someone at OSL who wasn't Grace. They, she, you had a teammate at that point. And I remember it was raining that day. And I said, because she was about to bring her work to Parsons from MIT. And I said, Grace, it's raining out right now. And um, I can't carry an umbrella. Uh, can you design me a coat that doesn't look like a Disney poncho? that I can actually wear you know, outside in the rain and not feel hideous. And she was like, of course. Um, so I didn't realize, like, I really got in at the ground floor of something that I think is so groundbreaking. So I had the honor of being one of the first people that you designed for at Parsons. And I don't think I've ever felt more loved in my life because they weren't just considering my measurements or even how I walk, they were like, okay, tell us what you do every day. Where do you go? Where do you speak? What's important to you? So things like they designed a set of purple wings inside my coat because Give Beauty Wings is my advocacy. Um, it's my nonprofit now and it's my self-esteem program. And so the purple wings were just for me. They were on the inside. Um, but I felt the love of this team that she assembled around me um, every time I wear the coat, but just the fact that it happened. So, so for me, I, I think it also relates back to this idea of fashion as activism or as so much more than just what we wear every day, right? Um, but maybe we can back up a little. I know we had talked about you know, defining this idea, what is inclusive fashion? Is anyone confused about that? Does anyone, like, because I think it's a, it's a big thing, and the reason I'm not using universal design in this moment is that I think universal design, when you just hear that, you don't necessarily know, may, might not know what it is. So do you guys want to talk about what is inclusive design or universal design for you? Um, because I, I don't know. It seems like we've got a lot of choir members in the audience, but for those that are kind of new to this concept, I think it would be great for us to define it. We've talked a lot about this since um, we had a little a phone call with the panelists this past week. Um, and you know, I think a lot of people do know what universal design is, you know, design that if you, you know, design something that's smart for somebody with a disability, it probably benefits everyone. And inclusive design to me really is, um, it's, yeah, it's really everything. It's, it's inclusive sizing, it's positive messaging, it's, doing everything in your power to not exclude somebody from an item that you might be designing. And in adaptive design, in a lot of ways, um, you know, each item that we have designed starts with someone's story or someone, um, you know, meeting somebody that you want to help, kind of like, I mean, Open Style Lab is like my dream. I want them to take me in the summer. Um, but... Uh, I did here first. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm losing my train of thought, but Amy's got a really good example. <laughs> Um, so recently at Target, we got to hear from a man named Dr. Daniel Grossman. Um, he's a doctor, obviously, <laughs> um, who was in a mountain biking accident and became paralyzed from the waist down. And he came into Target to share his story. And then Mary and I were lucky enough after to meet with him and talk, to, talk about adaptive clothing. But the first thing he said to us was like, I don't want adaptive clothing. I want regular clothing. And we're like, oh, well, we create adaptive clothing. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, and then he told us the story about the cut curb. So you know the part in the curb that is sloped. That was created for people with disabilities, actually veterans who had been injured. It's much like closed captioning. Before it was put into law, there was a huge fight by people with disabilities to have a special chip that you had to add to your TV. But now, everybody, in every airport, in every gym, people have the captions on TV all the time. And not only that, but it also makes the ability to search things that are in video format easier and possible. Because you can't search for images or you can't search for specific audio cues, but you can search for specific words tied to closed captioning. So while it started out as a fight among people with disabilities for access to TV, it's become accepted as the standard for everybody. 
Yeah, what it makes me think of too is the subways uh, with the elevators. I think recently we had a mother uh, with a stroller die because she, and she went shopping and couldn't carry the bags and the baby and, and she died on the stairs. And I feel like it's, it's sad that it would take something like that to bring it to national or international attention. Um, but I do think, yeah, it is true that inclusive or universal design, it benefits everyone. And I think it's such a powerful point that you made, Alexis. And I also think, looking at the three women, you know, to my left, um, it takes allies. Allies who really get it. And when we talk about allies, I think it, it's a complicated issue because what, what makes someone a true ally? Well, I can tell you that Grace was asked to speak at the UN for um, International Day of Persons with Disabilities to share her work, and she gave that spot to me. And I thought, wow, that is really generous. I mean, that's her platform, that's her time. But I think that you know, the work at Target wouldn't be the same if you guys weren't so passionate and pushing forward and tenacious. And, um, and so I think none of this work can be done alone, right? Whether we have disabilities or not, having people that really get it um, is, I mean, it's more than I can even put into words. I mean, to witness people that are fighting for inclusion, not because they have to necessarily, I mean, I think it's, it's beautiful when people say, yes, I have a daughter, or, but I think sometimes we think of that as some kind of qualification, um, but I think that the three of you here are, are proof that, you know, empathy, true empathy can go a long way, but not only that, it takes a little more chutzpah too, right? <laughs> um, and so, yes, and so I was wondering um, if we could talk a little bit about what some of the challenges for each of your brands has been, and I think it's interesting that we have Alexis, who's an entrepreneur, and really, you know, doing this from her own personal experiences with the conversations she's had and trying to use love and, and sign language in this universal way. And then you have um, Grace bringing the couture experience to the disability community. Um, and then you guys at, at Target, which have you know this big platform and obviously a very accessible platform and pricing even. Um, I'm curious what some of the perks and the challenges are within each of, if, if we could go down the line, maybe start with you guys at Target. What have been some of the things that have been surprised you in a good way and maybe some other, you know, not so easy things? Well, you know, as you can imagine at a large corporation, there's a lot of channels you have to go through to get really anything approved. Um, but when Amy, Stacy, and I started this journey of, um, doing research, I mean, simply it was for uh, sensory processing and autism, but we, the way that we were able to get our, like the leaders at Target that don't maybe even know anyone with a disability, the way that we got their buy-in was through telling stories about our guests. And um, once you, you know, really every person that we meet and, and every person that we've told the story about, it's really hard to forget those stories. And once you're touched by this, um, by someone with a disability, um, you really can't not do it after that. And so a lot of, um, and you know, we've been interviewed for just small things before, and, and it's no secret that all of us at Target that work on the adaptive clothing, it's our, our volunteer job. So we actually have full-time jobs doing, you know, what we're hired to do. Amy's a director, I'm a principal yeah. technical designer. But we dedicate our time on the nights and weekends and even during our work day to make sure that this work happens. And um, Amy said it, we've got you know probably 100 people that work between marketing and um, our site merchandising experience and our, um, a whole bunch of people that are behind it. But Is um, this it's part a challenge of, and it's... Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Is this part of Design for All? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that 100 person team is just for Design for All or mm -hmm. the adaptive line? Yeah. I mean, everyone, well, everyone that, that um, sorry, the way that I was trying to explain it was that everyone that works on the adaptive line or the design for all mm -hmm. also has an entire full-time job. Uh -huh. So it's, it's volunteers. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's passionate That's people. That's amazing. The, the same kind of that interest. That allyship we were talking about. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Well, yeah. oh, my goodness. 
Well, thank you guys for what you do. Um, I know it's not easy. I know it took a lot of tenacity to get there, um, but I tell you, we, we appreciate it. And I think also that Target, I'm happy that they recognize the role model that they can be for other brands too. Because, um, yeah, I think they're re they really did forge the way for so many other brands to say, hey, what about us? So, um, I mean, I feel a lot better about volunteering because <laughs> all of the people on our team have mostly full-time jobs. And they take their nighttime hours, weekends, my emails in the middle of the night or <laughs> at 6 in the morning to do workshops like today uh, with Chow and Karen this morning. Yeah. They gave a, a workshop on hacking and making uh, accessible and adaptive bags with uh, young kids. So that was fun. And I think without really them, I probably would not be here. I feel more like I'm always chasing after squirrels and being <laughs> like, here's the new park we need to go to. And we all get there. And then we all disperse and go back to our regular <laughs> jobs. But I can't imagine really the camaraderie of people that are willing to support if you just take the time to talk about your story. And hopefully, that's part of what we do is we team designers, engineers, and therapists who all have really interesting different egos and perspectives about things, <laughs> whether it's the user experience, the client, or um, it's the patient, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> we, we have defined, I think, certain stereotypes, but also ways of identifying with bodies and the way we dress from different fields. But when they all come together, we learn more. And I think with that power, we're able to create something really innovative. <laughs> so I see this especially in my classroom and really kind of taking this out to equip the future uh, kind of creators, engineers, and whatever body or diversity they're from to have those skills to talk about, I think, where's your catheter placed in your pants? Or what kind of wheelchair? Why are you using automatic versus you know manual? Just those conversations in, in an educational setting or just being uh, comfortable with is still not that easy. And to do that, you need everybody to just partake and have fun. I know that we talked a long time ago about how you're kind of like a doctor diagnosing the need, but and not in the clinical way. I mean, we talk about doctors and we think clinical, but I think because you're non-judgmental, you're like, okay, how do, you know, in a way, I think your engineering background or your very like direct way of, of communicating makes it just, okay, we gotta get from A to B, how, we, how do we do that, right? Without getting into like, <laughs> You know, because there's, yeah. there's a, the uh, cultural part of it too, which is, you know, there's the embarrassment of like, okay, I, I might need a catheter, or you know what I mean, that, that can come with that. And I feel like you cut through that b BS very easily <laughs> in a way. Um, so. Well, I mean, I think I'll ask the audience, how many of you guys have a cell phone? <laughs> Almost everybody, right? So when I used to work at Samsung Electronics, and this is an economic value for them, to make it inclusive or adaptive or accessible as a product for their launching cell phones for all people. Which means you got to interview you know, elderly as well as people with disabilities. And so I see this coming backwards from a technology industry trying to make, um, I guess, the adaption of a product more easy for people, whether it's the iPhone one touch button to like a better interface design. But I see the clothing that we wear is no different as the interface that we're trying to tell the people who we are and how we're expressing ourselves. Right. So in that way, I think it's the same thing. It's just more intimate and comfortable <laughs> than the screen. Thank you. And Alexis, as a entrepreneur and obviously having this as a passion project and a form of activism or, or communication, I, I'd love to hear from you. How's it been? Um, what's this process been like for you? What are some of the unexpected perks and challenges? I think one key message that I would like to share is that some people might perceive this as a luxury item. But I think we're moving away from old luxury where we're used to viewing other big brands, expensive brands, and that we wanted them to define what luxury meant. And so people would purchase those items. But now we're moving to a more modern luxury where we define what luxury means for us and in a way that allows us to define our own personal brand. And is that a luxury? I don't really think so. But I think we're starting to shift the way people are thinking 
from old luxury to new luxury. So that's definitely one challenge that Rose by Ander is gonna have to face as a company, which I think we'll quickly overcome anyway. And you also asked me how I got here, or what was the second part of your question, Xi'an? Oh, well, you mentioned the <laughs> challenge, but maybe something that surprised you uh, that's positive about this experience so far? So we're new, but from what I can see in the conversations happening out there while we're building our brand, mm -hmm. is that people are very excited to be able to speak about who they are by just having a choice of things to pick from to represent themselves. I think that's one of the biggest perks that we've noticed and that we're seeing currently. I think the conversations that are coming from this are extremely organic, and that's been beautiful. Yeah. Well, love is very universal, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and I have to give you praise, I think, for creating a luxury brand, because some could say that's exclusive, but I actually think the fact that, you know, that it, in a way it's breaking stereotypes just by being, because I think there's so much expectation that things that people with disabilities have are medical, or, you know, that phrase, why can't we have, uh, this is why we can't have nice things. I think <laughs> um, that in, in so many ways, it's great that if there are luxury brands for everyone, why can't there be you know, a, a you know, disability inclusive jewelry line, you know? Um, and it is for everyone, and at the same time, very universal. So um, I think that's groundbreaking in a way. Um, hopefully we'll get to the point where it's not, but I'm so glad that you um, saw the value in that. Um, and I have to give a plug because I got to wear it for today. <laughs> um, yes. So do you want to tell us, Alexis, um, when will these be available? I, I believe you said next week, right? Yes, this week. We're going to be launching this week. So I'm very excited about that. I'm trying to make sure that all our ducks in a row and everything is perfect. Can everybody yeah. see? <laughs> You can't blame me, right? They're so beautiful. I, I have big things going on. <laughs> but, um, but no, and I think, I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful thing you're doing, and we look forward to seeing it grow. And I'm excited for everyone here because you're really seeing it at the ground floor before its big, big, you know, debut. Um, but I, I think, yes, it's and it's so wonderful. I think even beyond jewelry, um, just to have more entrepreneurs with disabilities who are doing it with grace and dignity and, you know, even putting a budget behind something because, to be honest with you, um, disability community and money is not, I mean, it's usually talked about in, in what we don't have instead of what we do have. So it'll be exciting to see it grow. And I think you're going to be an example for entrepreneurs who didn't know that they could be. Well, because Alexis... Did it, so can I. Yeah, and we were talking briefly earlier about the data. And the data is there to support these businesses. One of you already mentioned on the panel today about one in four people, but maybe you wanted to talk about the market value of people with disabilities, because I think that's a really important thing for our audience to understand. Yeah, well, I think the number that we, and this may even be a little slim, but the number that we're aware of is that the purchasing power of people with disabilities is, and their caretakers are at least $1 trillion, um, which is something that I don't think we should bypass easily. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, Alexis, because um, hopefully in, in this group, I think the fact that you're here means we probably do not need to convince you. But, um, but I think it is something that people forget, that we do, we do have the power to make choices with fashion. And, and I think fashion is such a big part of identity making <laughs> and a part of success. You know, People want to dress a certain way if they know they're going to ha have a job interview, right? We're, and we want to be able to represent ourselves beyond function, right? So that's one of the reasons that this panel is called Fashion Beyond Function. Um, and maybe that's a good place for us to kind of, I, I would love to hear a bit more from each of you about 
where would you like to see your brands go? Because we know we have those facts. We have a, a trillion uh, dollar budget. We have 1.3 billion people in the world with disabilities. Where would you like to see inclusive design, universal design, adaptive design go? I would say for us and something we talk about a lot is that we would love to see the retail industry as a whole change. Um, Mindy Shire, who is, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of from Runway of Dreams, she's one of the first people that we talked to about this idea just to learn, her, learn from her and her experience. Um, and her whole mission is to change retail so that every brand offers adaptive and inclusive product. And I think our dream is that that happens in our lifetime. Um, you know, not just here and there at one, at one retailer, small and one big, um, is just to see it everywhere. Great. Um, I do want to mention, too, that um, just this past week, we announced um, our first sensory uh, collection of kids' furniture. Um, oh. And that's also available on, I'm not trying to give a business <laughs> plug here, but hey, that's, get it in, girl. it's also available online <laughs> now. So it's um, really people give our small and mighty team you know, credit for starting the movement, um, but it's it families need that, and especially at the at the price points that Target can offer it and the quality, so that things last. Um, that's super important to us. Yeah, and I think what you brought up actually makes me want to segue to you, Grace, for a second, because one of the reasons that we wanted to bring you back, other than the fact that you did brilliantly last time <laughs> you were on the panel, was that. You've, I mean, really expanded. OSL, Open Style Lab, is not just about clothes anymore. You've worked with IKEA, and I mean, we had the Hack It Back, where you had us bring in things that we need. And do you see, you know, Open Style Lab evolving in that way? Um, and can you yeah, I mean, I think uh, maybe I'll take a step back before I talk about OSL. It's just when you see any kind of business, and especially fashion or retail, there's this kind of tension between high customized needs and then also really for everyone, right? And that tension I see when it comes to big retailers and then I see smaller brands trying to evolve. So where I see Open Stab's future is still negotiating between wherever that middle ground is. Because I told it to Vox, I've told to New York Times all the times when people are like, who's your market? I'm like, it's for all people. They're like, all right, so who's your market? Is it for women or is it for like the millennials? Like what kind of millennials? And we're like, no, you don't get it. So I think yeah. that kind of conversation helps bridge those gaps and to have them a touch point with not just our team, but the way we work, the way we work with people is I think that is something I want to keep evolving and hopefully into education where I still see a lot of barriers for even people with disabilities or people with diverse, I think, backgrounds to have, I think, the environment as well as the just attitude of like a welcoming education. And mm -hmm. if you could agree with me, I don't think anybody should be denied that kind of right. And especially not denied the right to be dressed the way you are and not be judged when you step into a building like Parsons. <laughs> but that's where I hope we go, is into educational and that middle ground I think of tying uh, these wonderful businesses and I think the people, the communities. Because I think, Sean, you might agree with me, a lot of people with disabilities, and especially disability communities, they're still quite stylish themselves as much as fashion is as an industry. So if you've got like Cerebral Palsy Foundation or if you've got spinal cord injury, like to have them all sit together with a bunch of fashion students is a whole different world. And for us to keep, I think, challenging that, and even with, I think, students of all types of design, that really makes us learn something and them also learn something too. Yeah, I definitely want to hear your answer to this, Alexis, but I did want to jump in there because I think it's a good segue. I, I feel, and let me know what you think of this, but I really feel that fashion used to be something where a designer created something, and no matter how impractical or ridiculous it looked, we were expected to embrace whatever fad was going on. Girls were dieting, and you know, there was all kinds of things about, um, you know, I mean, maybe thinking of fashion more as art rather than as something that serves the body or the mind or the spirit. And I, I find, and, um, and I'm curious to hear from the audience too a little later, uh, I find now there's so much more in terms of embracing, um, 
you know, uh, just people of all sizes. Of, uh, and, and so it seems to me that design, and maybe this has to do with the internet or social media being available, the fact that we all can kind of write to companies and say, this is what I need, this is what I want. It seems to me that, that companies and designers are being called to design for our bodies, no matter how unique they are, whether they answer that call and how long that takes for them to answer that call, it seems to me there's a shift. Now we're saying, this is how I want to look and this is how I want to be defined. Instead of saying, okay, now I have to figure out how the heck am I going to get my butt into skinny jeans or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so, I, I don't know, but I, I feel like there is a change and maybe that's why adaptive or universal design has been flourishing. Um, what do you guys think? Do you agree? <laughs> it's a big thing to think about. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's not new news that, you know, designers and retailers want to hear from the guest and especially when you're designing this type of clothing, you, you know, I don't have a disability. So for me to make assumptions about what it would be like um, you know, that's really presumptuous and you make a lot of mistakes that way. Um, I forget if, if it was, or no, I think Grace was telling us, um, someone was telling me today about a, a class or a um, activity or workshop they did around um, having their students have a disability for eight hours. Was somebody telling me that today? Oh, that was you. Um, it was during, we actually led a workshop today earlier here. Um, and, you know, that even, if you have a, a temporary disability, you know, that's even different than having a permanent disability. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I actually got into trouble. There's some NYU students here. Can you guys raise your hands? We love you guys. We love Faye. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I might not be invited back to... Uh, the medical school at NYU. And part of the reason is, and I, I, I don't regret it, is that I kind of, I remember sitting in front of a, a, a classroom of first year um, aspiring doctors, medical students, and um, I was told that they did a four hour exercise where they had to be in a wheelchair. And I said, you guys got off easy. <laughs> I said, if that were me, I would probably make it at least a week. And here's, here's why. Because if you're in a wheelchair for four hours, no matter who you are, you're going to hate it. Because there's no time to get creative. There's no time to say, oh, hey, wait, I can do things this way. It's just, this sucks. You know what I mean? And actually having the experience on a daily basis of whatever the challenge may be, you know, you get creative. You're like, oh, wait, I can do this. You know what I mean? So I actually thought it was a terrible thing that they only got four hours, because that's not going to give you a realistic experience. That's like putting on a baby bump for four hours and saying, this is what it's like to be pregnant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, obvious, and especially if it's a nine-month belly, you know, mothers have nine months to get to that point, you know? So I just think that sometimes what we think of as uh, empathy experience experience or an ally experience is not complete until you're in that situation and that's why it's so important as we design to design with dis people with disabilities there and not just say okay because you had uh, you were in a wheelchair for four hours you now understand what it is to be in a wheelchair right so we're getting a little off the topic I still wanted to ask you Alexis where you want to see your brand go and what your hopes are for uh, Rose Byander <laughs> so I agree with everything that everybody on the panel has said, but I would like to see the terms and the labels go away. Like inclusive, adaptive, accessible. I think all of those terms should go away. Mm -hmm. It should just be designing for all, and that's it. We don't have to have this conversation. <laughs> I love it. That's my hope for the future. It's great. Yeah, I could agree with that <laughs> tremendously because I, I find language can be sometimes a difficulty, especially in the classroom, and having that first-person language is quite important, but also I think acknowledging maybe the word disability uh, stays in some context to acknowledge the political rights that have been fought for. Ooh. So I think there are some pros and cons about how you want to describe the situation or I think uh, someone's someone's experience uh, with accessible boundaries, but 
I think I'd like to go back to the point of creativity. Sure. And I think that's the essential point, right? That yeah. even people with disabilities are creative. They've been adapting or hacking or redesigning all around themselves and how to celebrate that, I think, with more diverse people. I think as a designer myself and being trained, you don't, you don't design in a box alone. You, <laughs> you have to kind of go out there and try and work with other people. And likewise, um, I'll probably call out for our summer program. We have an annual 10-week summer program where we invite international and national uh, students as well as professionals, even from age 55. We've had an OT join us, and they collaborate with people with disabilities. <laughs> and it's, it's just supposed to be about I think celebrating that creativity and having that being part of the driving force for 10 weeks. And this year we're working with NYU Langone's um, Women with Initiatives with Disabilities, thanks to Sean. And so they're young teen girls um, with various disabilities, but they're going to be telling us about what style means to them. So we're excited to bring in some influences of STEM as well as arts and design to talk about what style could mean. And I think more so maybe the future of clothing and what that really means. Because I'm coming from the tech industry where they're like trying to predict what we're going to need 10 years from down, whether it's VR gear or AR gear or like step platforms or whatever internet of things and Google Home <laughs> <laughs> to talk to you when you're lonely. But <laughs> I think it's, it's really interesting that technology's thought about it this far. So I think why not pose that challenge to fashion and what would that future look like for us? Because slowly and slowly our, our wearable space or what we define as wearable is getting broader, whether there's beacon technology or there's wearable tech um, you know, coming from Google Jacket. So I, I think the boundaries are limitless. And for us to equip and go together is probably the biggest yeah. importance and not feeling anyone's neglected in the process. Yeah. And I would say, too, I forgot to mention when I talked about my coat, you know, working with people, I learned from those designers because they watched me put on my traditional coat, the one you know that I wear every day, and every single time I would get the back of my coat caught on the back of my chair. I was so used to just jiggling with it and whatever, you deal with it, right? Part of being creative and as a person with it, you just roll with whatever. And it never occurred to me that that happened. So what, what they did was they actually created a higher coat tail so that I wouldn't get the back of my coat caught anymore. Um, and so, anyway, I mean, I think this is the beauty. And when I think of, um, I've worked with AT&T for their assistive technology and um, for a, a project called the Connectability Challenge. And what I learned is that so many developers came to us with technology that simply wasn't that useful to us until we had conversations about, have you thought about this? And then they also said, well, have you thought about this? Did you think about putting this on your ski pole or whatever it is? So the power of collaboration, it's more than a product. It's, it's lifestyle. It's culture. Um, you know, and I think that really what we're creating when we create fashion or, or design that works, we're actually creating a cultural shift. Um, just like a curb cut would be, or even Amazon Alexa would be. Um, yeah, so anyway, I, I don't know how much time we have because I could literally talk to you ladies all day and keep everyone, because um, I definitely want to. But I want to also give you guys time to chat. Where are we time-wise? Are we OK? OK, so this is, I think, a perfect time to open this up to questions and comments. Um, and then, yes, yay, hello. Let me see. Yeah, yes. we do just have a microphone. This is being recorded, so just for the purposes of documentation, if you could raise your hand, more housekeeping, and I will bring you the microphone. Um, yes, <laughs> on the way. And we will get to everyone. Sean left a nice amount of time for folks' Yay. questions. Thank yes, you, Sean. We've got elbow room. Um, I'll, I'll just define what I said about uh, what was mentioned about the uh, class. Um, I should background and say that it was at Drexel University. And um, unfortunately, I was limited um, with the amount of time I could have the students with their disability because of insurance. Yeah. And the school would not allow them to be um, more than eight hours, even though that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted them to go home and with, mm. with what they were experiencing. Mm. Um, but I'd like to say who my trainer was. My p trainer was Michael Graves. And Michael Graves um, was, I spent a day with him in his office. And uh, he had me in his wheelchair and showing me around how he designed things. And so I brought that experience to the students that I worked with, that I worked with. 
And uh, the other part of it is my experience is that I was um, vice president fashion director at home at Bloomingdale's and right. also um, creative fashion director for, um, creative director for MoMA. So um, I'm very involved in product. And also my mother had polio. So um, I've experienced all of that in my life. And so when um, I wanted those students to experience their life and how they could really st design for this, for what we're talking about. And um, it was a very interesting experience and they experienced their university and how their university actually didn't have the accessibility that they thought it would have. And I wouldn't allow them to have any help for that, for those eight hours, no assistance at all. Mm. And so it was a very, it was very amazing. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear what you all are talking about, about the next generation of what we're doing with um, product. Because um, I think product, I think product inclusive design is, first of all, cross-generational. Mm. And um, I think it's cross-sexual. And I'm going to say it's also cross-color. And I think that no one really thinks about that. And so um, that's, I'm so glad that you guys are celebrating what you're doing. Thank I hope you. all of you have major, major successes in everything that you do. And I'm bravo to Target. I'm, I'm just <laughs> so proud of what you're doing. Thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank Ronnie, who's right beside me here, who invited Hi, me. Hi. Love you. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, before she speaks, I have to just point. Suganda is an amazing textile uh, instructor at Parsons also. Um, same institution as Grace. And in an incredible human being, a survivor, and just one of my sheroes. So before you speak, I had to give a proper intro. Thank you. Thank you Please. so much. I'm honored. Uh, I want to thank Ronnie Raymond here, right beside me, who invited me to this panel. Thank you, Ronnie. This was a very stimulating and enriching mm -hmm. conversation that I want to add a little bit more to. Great. And for everybody's knowledge, I'm visually impaired, and I'm very proud of it. And I want to say that people with disabilities are not just uh, members of society who are contributing, but they're also adding value. We are valuable, and disability is desirable. And I want everyone here to think about it, including the students, to think about disabilities as value additions, that those challenges that are perceived uh, only from the medical model are not just challenges. They are actually pathways to innovation. And that's all I want you all to take, take home with you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to make one comment based off of, you know, Alexis made an interesting point about wanting to get to a point beyond the terminologies. And I think, I think it's important, I, I think I can say this pretty safely, that I don't think your point was about erasure, erasure at all. Not erasing, but in, it just being so integrated into society that it no longer becomes a, a divisionary or separatist idea. Correct. Right. So, so I think what you're saying is really important and celebrating disability. Fashion is a big part of celebration of all identity, but disability is a huge part of that. So I, I thank you for that point, Suganda. I think it's really important that, yeah, we realize that we all have value and that by including voices and needs of people with disabilities, you're making the world richer and better for everyone. Right? And I, I think that's such a great point that you're making. Um, so I saw a hand here in the front, in the second row. Hi. Oh, sorry. OK. <laughs> yep. sorry. I'm not wearing my Sean, glasses. I'm just going to remind sorry. you that the microphone is making the rules right now. OK. So, so microphone is boss. We will get to everyone, Ruth and we the will microphone get to everyone, are boss. I promise. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, all. Busy. Thank you very much. First, uh, two short points. First. Uh, Really expressing gratitude that this problem now go public. It's not just private. I introduce in here my friend, Victoria Garelik. She is a survivor of cerebral palsy and artist herself. And struggling in these two vectors, trying to bring it together. So she is a founded um, nonprofit organization called Para Art Foundation. Mm. So like Paralympic, it's a para art. 
So hi, Victoria. Yeah, hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, one of her main projects is to design actual clothing because she experienced this in her oven. So how difficult it is. And mm. she come out with many different ideas how it should be. So to make it accessible and really beautiful, not just something to grab and, you know, wear whatever. And we would like to invite actually people <laughs> to us. So if you would like to be part of this amazing field to help in making this world more accessible to all people, not just like normal one, quote to say, but to all who have soul and artistic desires and express themselves, you know, to be part of the society, valuable society. So welcome aboard. We have many venues, and please thank you very much. <laughs> so. Great, great, always to hear from Victoria. Um, and I think the international perspective is an interesting one. I, actually, if there's anyone in in the audience or here that wants to talk about the, I, we talked a little bit about Japan and China uh, in the green room. Um, but, you know, I, I think it is an interesting thing, you know, when you have a culture of ADA. I grew up for the most part, I, I, I was born before the ADA, but got to see really the fruits of the ADA already in my life growing up. And, I'm, you know, I think it is a different thing when you haven't had that cultural support or the legal support or, um, so I would love to hear from anyone if, uh, and maybe Victoria at some point we could talk about this, but I think it is important to think about this in a global, on a global front. Um, oh, you got it, okay. Thank you so much for this wonderful panel. And one of the things that I'm going to remember is the way you have articulated um, kind of the goals, that terms and labels go away, that stories fuel innovation. And I'm wondering from, um, from the target perspective, have you, uh, in order to um, share this information with the public, even people who may not have this particular need, but, um, and perhaps through that to make um, all clothing adaptable, the, the goal you mentioned for, of Mindy Shire. Um, do you, uh, when you advertise your products, do you, for instance, in, in the stores, which one of which just opened across the street from me, um, <laughs> um, have, is it possible to have like videos of some of these stories and how you've addressed the issue just for the public, um, not necessarily related to the, the particular sale? Um, and I have another question after um, uh, if that, that if it's possible. I can take that one sure. if you want. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of the uh, sensory friendly and adaptive apparel are offered online uh -huh. and the great thing about that is that attached to each product is that video that you saw uh -huh. so people can learn the story behind it uh -huh. and then also we've partnered really closely with the people that create the product content so that you can s understand and see each functionality that each garment uh -huh. has uh -huh. um, so you know what you're getting uh -huh. and why we created it so the online <laughs> venue has been great for communication. But what about the um, the brick and mortar store? Just that people come in and as they shop, maybe just stop for a few seconds or a few minutes mm -hmm. and learn about this. Is, is that something that would be possible? So this video is actually being played within mm -hmm. the Target stores. Um, uh -huh. Most of the TVs are within the electronics department, but I, I, I actually was walking through with my children and all of a sudden they were like, Mommy, that's you. And I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but so if you pay attention next uh -huh. time you're in the store, you might actually see the video being played um, in your store, okay. along, with, along with others. Uh -huh. yeah. So maybe also um, when you're shopping at a Target store and you're um, looking for a T-shirt, Mm -hmm. It would be great if it called out on the signage next to the t-shirts that this is also available on Target.com in sensory friendly. Uh -huh. um, and we have that same um, thing with our, with our extended sizing. So we do a lot of plus size in kids and uh -huh. plus size in women's and sometimes there's just not enough room in the store. So we need to do a better job at calling it out yeah. so that more people know. Because I just, I've been fortunate to do some design research um, as a person with an industrial design background. Mm -hmm. Um, for the Cooper Hewitt and interviewing people with blindness and low vision. 
um, as to the products that help them navigate the city, cook, dress, et cetera, manage money. And um, the same concern arose in that research, you know, how do we create a market that um, accepts, includes, um, that it's nothing, for instance, to, to create, uh, for instance, a bathroom that serves uh, from babyhood to seniorhood, which mm. the Michael Graves organization is, is aiming to do. Um, so that's why I'm thinking about along those lines. If I may ask one more question of Grace. Um, you mentioned you're working with seniors as well. Um, could you give an example or two of the kinds of concerns? Are they, are they different or are they in the same category? Because um, um, perhaps uh, I'm working with the Design for Aging Committee of the AIA and maybe mm. there's some. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, first, maybe a comment on the store experience. Mm -hmm. Please invite Open Style Lab. We will hack your store. We, <laughs> we did that for retail, I, I'll name nameless, but we just literally went to their store for the day and, and went to their dressing rooms and also the aisles that were too short and the signage and everything. And I think that created a lot of buzz for people who were shopping in that very store and for us to just hoard everyone in that we knew to bring in from um, diverse groups. Mm -hmm. But back to your topic of aging. So we actually worked with uh, Riverside Rehab last year and their long-term residents. They have about 500 short-term and I think about 350 long-term residents there. And it's interesting because over my four years of a short career in this area, I've noticed there are some common denominators between disability, aging, and injury. So we've, we definitely think there are some common links and that the dressing experience is not just limited to clothes anymore, but the things around you. So it's really about lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's really about, I think what, like I mentioned, is that wearable space because it's not just on your body. It's a little bit maybe beyond. And so with the aging, and I think this is interesting because you know, you, when we're at, I think, a, a store or we're looking at a product or from an industrial perspective, we want to capture that feedback back of like what that design product does or experience is like. Mm -hmm. But many times, sometimes video and sometimes other mediums are, are better to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And I had the first failure of this last year when I tried to send a survey to all the residents at Riverside Rehab who are above the age of 65. And I realized about 40% had about mild dementia and Alzheimer's. So when you get the responses back about how tight your socks are, you're going to get a <laughs> different type of scribble and response, which we didn't anticipate. So we tried different methods uh, of communicating. And I think that in itself is really going to help validate not just getting a one-to-one -one feedback channel, but what does that data collecting look like, I think, today. And it's just better to have a party in a yeah. store anyway. But. Well, and um, I, I'm, Grace, I remember you telling me a story about one particular resident who was so resistant in the beginning. And then at the end, he was like, I'm here. I did this. And like he took all the credit for what happened. But, but I think it was a big win just to come, I mean, that there was reluctance. And that over that time, you were able to not only win him over, but he wanted to take credit for the whole thing. I mean, it's. Um, I, I thought think that's that was how we're beautiful. approached, right? <laughs> like we, yeah. we asked, like, how many people have challenges with buttons or zippers? And I kid you not, all the seniors were like, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. And we're like, of course, if you ask someone that kind of question, they're not going to tell you that they have problems or like admit that these are struggles. They'd rather see it as a design opportunity, as an empowerment for their dignity. So I think addressing that question is really going to get you a better answer to that product. And also about building trust, right? Trust with your consumer. That's why it's 10 weeks. Oh yeah, by the way, please apply. Yeah. April 12th. Right. <laughs> 10 weeks. Um, before we take the next question, which we were happy to have, I wanted to address what, you, uh, what the person in the second row, what's your name, dear? Aaron. Karen. Oh, Karen. Um, what you said actually echoes a frustration I have with a lot of um, amazing um, design and tech, um, not just maybe Target or any other fashion brand, but I've worked with, um, you know, AT&T, you know, for this project. We had amazing technology. We awarded this money, and then I never heard about these technologies again. 
And then Microsoft, I know, has uh, 365, where they have live captioning on any presentation that you do on Microsoft, and they don't advertise that. How, you know, so I think what you're getting at is not an issue of one particular brand, but I think that basically corporations don't know how to market even these amazing things that they're innovated on a daily basis. Um, so anyway, I think there's a bigger conversation there. We could probably do a whole another panel on that. Um, but I thank you for that question because I think it's a, it's a bigger issue than one brand in particular and it, it's really important. And something that I would like to see change is that we celebrate these things and if they're working so hard on these innovations, I think they should be celebrated, I don't know, with better PR. Oh, Liz. Um, yes, anyway, there's so much, but. I have, my oldest daughter has a disability. She has a chromosomal anomaly, 18Q minus. And it's interesting because I kind of want to talk about this and I, I wonder, even myself, as the, when we talk about language, even I find myself some, and I work for positive exposure, even sometimes I find myself on, on like as the words change and the terminology and mm. what is acceptable and what is not, right? And that keeps changing yeah. and depending on you know, if it's globally or here, it, it, and I feel also, I wonder if that happens with companies and corporations where they're, they're also sort of tongue, they're just, they're unsure as how to present it because right. if they present it a certain way and they People get negative it. feedback, you know, so right. I think there's a little bit of, uh, yeah. I, uh, there's, it's, it's yeah. difficult, right? Well, just to back up a little bit, positive exposure, I want to give you guys a little plug. Talking about allies, um, Rick Gudati, who's right here in the front with us, started an amazing organization where he really took his talent for photography and brought it to a group of people like us um, that didn't necessarily uh, see ourselves being in front of the camera. That means, so he committed what, it's 20 plus years now of his life to putting his camera um, to shine light on people with disabilities in the most beautiful, compassionate way. And he got a lot of pushback, by the way, and I think it is. I can't keep track of all the language changes. Um, you know, I remember being on a bus about four years ago and the word special needs came out and an advocate said, I hate that term. And I'm like, okay, so I can't use special needs now? Like, I, you know, I'm learning all the time, and so my answer to that is always ask the person, and I don't think there's one answer, unfortunately, and that's part of why we have that tension. Um, but can we take one more question? Yes, Thank I think you, we, have, we have Lovely. time. I'm just gonna call it out now so we all know. We're gonna do two more questions at oh. the microphone, but I'm gonna invite folks. Hopefully it's okay that the panelists are willing to stay a little bit after. Not I'm too. sorry, I'm going off script. I'm gonna invite Woo! folks now. That's we're, where all the good we're stuff happens. We're gonna do two questions in the microphone, but I'm gonna invite folks to still stay and ask questions, Cute. have a conversation. The museum is open, I think, till nine o'clock. I think I should know that, but I think it's <laughs> I think it's nine. Um, Can we do like so night at the museum and late sleep night over? At the museum. We can't stay over. It's a Smithsonian Slumber policy, party. But, all right. So two more questions in the mic, and then everyone else, please do stay and ask your questions. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, everybody, for a wonderful panel. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so this actually wasn't my question, but I just want to mention, I just recently saw an episode of Speechless with my daughter, where people know Speechless, yeah. um, and this very feisty mom, and um, one, three kids, one with cerebral palsy. Anyway, and she goes to a male strip joint and gets the idea <laughs> of Velcro and clothing for her son. It's just like a great episode. Um, <laughs> But I, but I, I actually just wanted to, put, to just clarify and maybe ask a question about the labor issues that you mentioned that you are all, uh, with the exception of Alexis, who's the entrepreneur here, like how come all of this is volunteer? And I just want to yeah. underscore Sean's point over and over right. again, so important. This is a very big, growing demographic. It's also a political point, the last elections Wow. May we hide, hang our heads in shame? Yeah. But um, you know, it was the first time that the Democratic Party even took into account how large and important 
the constituency of people with disabilities are in this country just at the first time a convention was made accessible. But for the same reason, why isn't a corporation like Target paying you guys and hiring people full time to be doing that work? Like the fact, I love that you're doing it for your passion projects, but also I'm just concerned that like with such a big market and like as Sean says over and over again, why is it that that can't be seen as something that deserves to have full time staff that, uh, you know, who are doing this design as they're part of their uh, important creative projects? Wow. <laughs> You know, I'll uh, be reserved in kind of how I answer that, but um, <laughs> yeah, no, um, no, we have really amazing support from our leaders, especially I, I know Todd Waterbury is like really um, a dear friend of Cooper Hewitt, and um, he's a huge supporter of the work that we're doing. And um, you know, I think it's just a matter of time and. You know, we're not the only company, obviously, with, um, you know, Grace doing, you know, a lot of people behind the scenes making it happen. Um, we are, in, you know, inspired by um, Zappos Adaptive. Um, we know that they, we met them at the Runway of Dreams Gala in September. And they did the same thing we did for several years where it was the passionate people and the movement that carried it. And now they have a dedicated team. So I think it's just a matter of time, to be honest, you know, in, in our case. Um, yeah, I can add to that, too. You know, the direction that we're trying to head to is that we're consulting all the brands so that each designer can have the empathy that we've gained just through all the people that we've met and talked to. So rather than even creating a team of people that focus on adaptive design, why not have all of our designers have the empathy that we've had the privilege of gaining from everyone we've met. So, you know, I appreciate your question so much and the audience's support. Um, I also think it's time to maybe even look at it differently um, so that every designer is creating for it, yeah. for all guests. Yeah, I think that question. <laughs> Just to repeat the question, um, for accessibility reasons and um, the recording, uh, just asking how we as consumers can support that work, if that's a fair summary. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I think first of all, as a nonprofit, we're still seen as like a charity case. And it's interesting to me because if you've ever gone to like religious churches or organizations, like no one's telling you to get up on Sunday and go. You just go and you donate your time. And I feel like that mentality has still not been transferred or valued maybe to echo back into the work that we've been doing. So I would love to call out for anyone that wants to support. It's really been hard for me to fundraise, to be very bluntly honest. I go after about 10 grants a year. I don't sleep. I've got my students there who are trying to conquer the world and you know, hopefully they can make the change. But also just looking at companies to make that change, a lot of them are a little bit skeptical. They're a little like kind of scared to put their toes in. Unlike maybe Target or Zappos that have been taking the lead internally, without that, it really just kind of becomes like, so you're making for disabled people? And I'm like, okay, so we're back to square one. <laughs> and that conversation, Take sometimes, I've had about three years to build with a brand, four years, five years, going after the same foundation. So mm. I encourage if anyone wants to support us, I'm actually selling my books. And part of those proceeds are going to Open Style Up this summer because those girls need better supplies. Yeah. So, Yeah, I also think that that's why what Alexis is doing is so important because, you know, by valuing her brand, um, I think she's actually breaking those stereotypes of the, the charity model of clothing or the charity model of anything. And, and I've got to tell you that, Faye, your question hit me in the solar plexus because it's not just fashion. Um, you know, I've been speaking for eight years. My first time speaking was with Rick of Positive Exposure. So thank you, Rick. Um, I don't think he realized how inviting me, again, being a great ally, he invited me into the room. Um, but, I, but I realized, you know, I was recently asked to speak at an employment 
uh, for disabilities organization. Like that is what they do. They they fight for you know equal employment and things like that. And they asked me to come to speak to a room full of corporate partners, but we don't have a budget. Wait, I want you to really think about that for a second. Okay, and I wrote them a very, um, you know, kindly worded email saying, <laughs> <laughs> listen, you know, if you are trying to convince corporations that people with disabilities, time and work has value, <laughs> even if you have a meager budget, it's a mark of respect for anyone that does speak on your behalf and for this particular cause to offer them something for their time Right? And be a role model in this area. You know what I mean? And the thing is, the old me would have been just happy to be in the room. And I think that is not just me. I think that we're moving toward a, a place in time and history where we're not just happy to be here. That's actual, really, money. Like, you know what I mean? I was so used to taking whatever <laughs> that that gave me the courage to write the email that I told you guys about. I realized, wait, that is my value, and that is my rate. And you know what I'm saying? And um, it's not my only value, right? right? I'm not actually putting a price on a person with a disability. But it takes, you know, for me, it took that example to say, OK, no, no, no. I actually, I've done this to a point where I've earned this, right? And now I can actually say, no, this is the standard by which I will speak and I will advocate and do whatever it is that I do. So it's a much bigger question that you're asking. And fashion is one area where we can you know, move that needle. And I thank all the women here for being a part of moving that forward. And did we? Did we have both questions? Or we <laughs> are going to wrap here. OK. So you're bringing us to a nice conclusion. If yeah. You, yeah. But, um, but I'm so glad that, I mean, there's so much more to say. And we'll just have to have another one of these soon. <laughs> Can I invite us over? Yes. Well, yeah, we're inviting ourselves back at some point <laughs> to talk to you again. But any other questions that we didn't answer, we're happy to chat with you later. Yeah, so we will need to do another big round of applause to all of you, though. Thank you. Thank you. But also, before we go, was there anything you ladies wanted to ask? Any last words? I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> I want to know what's behind um, the name of your brand. Ah. OK, so <laughs> Rose by Ander is the name. Ander is my maiden name and represents my family. So my sister and my mother, obviously my mother was in this field for so long. So that represents my, herit my heritage. Rose represents harmony and love. So Rose by Ander, love and harmony by Ander. Oh, Thank okay. you for asking. <laughs> yeah. Took me a really long time to figure that out. Yes. <laughs> well, I want to say that Alexis is such a powerful woman as a civil rights lawyer. I, I did ask her before this. I said, I want to know, why didn't you name it for yourself? So um, I'm happy that we got some of that answer. Thank you. You're amazing. Thank you all. Well, so thanks, thanks everyone for, for being here. Thank you for spending your Saturday on this important conversation.